Welcome to my next video on acrylic painting techniques. Today I'm going to be sharing with you guys my various materials that I use, paints, brushes, canvas and so forth. Hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, let's get started with the paints. Obviously I enjoy using top quality paint, uh, both Galerian and Lucas, really good paints, lovely to work with. And something to look out for when buying acrylics is a quality indicator. Uh, that's often stated, should be stated, on uh, any tube of good quality paint uh, and it's a permanence indicator. This is a guide for the artist as to the quality of the paint. So at times I've been asked, is all canvas the same? Definitely not. There are various thicknesses, various textures, different weaves. I enjoy using a fine weave canvas for my aviation art especially. I used to use a rougher textured canvas, uh, but the weave wasn't quite as tight and it consumed more paint uh, and it wasn't best suited to my style. Here you can see a texture comparison. On to the brushes. The three standard brushes I use is firstly a number 24 flat watercolor brush, um, a flat hard bristled number 4 or 6 oil acrylic brush, and then lastly a round watercolor brush usually ranging between number two to number four. The large watercolor brush being a soft bristled brush and ideal for covering large areas. Uh, the smaller hard bristled oil or acrylic brush uh, is ideal for more textured work. You can get more aggressive with that brush and of course then the small watercolor brush I use for finishing work and detail. Now for the fun part. Once your paints on the palette keep your paints wet, have a water spray bottle handy and spray your paints every 10 to 15 minutes. Now I'm going to give a quick demonstration in red. Firstly red thinned with a bit of water, a touch of white added and a bit of yellow, then red straight out of the tube and lastly red thinned with a bit of water. Now let's compare these three starting with the red at the bottom and as mentioned before, it's red that's simply diluted with water, thinned with water. And I don't know if it's visible on the screen, but it is transparent. In other words, you can see the texture of the canvas shining through. And that's something to remember when using acrylics. Unless you add white to your paint, it has no body. Um, it's a transparent paint. So adding white to acrylic, adding white to your color as it comes out the tube, adds body to the paint. In other words, it will be a solid color and as it dries. But what happens when you add white to a color? It makes it lighter. But what else happens? Um, it mutes the color. You lose the intensity of the color. That is why, as you can see me mixing here, I'm mixing my red. I've added a touch of white to make it a solid color to give me a pink. But with that, I've added more red and especially a touch of yellow. And the yellow breaks that pink and brings it back to red. And before I continue, let's quickly cover the other two examples. The middle one being red straight out of the tube. You can see it doesn't apply particularly well and that the uh, texture of the canvas coming through. Um, the top example being red slightly thin with a touch of white added, basically a pink. But you can see that being thinned uh, its surface coverage is so much better. Continuing now with the bottom example, that layer of paint is dried, I'm now giving it a second coat with a solid color. In other words, it's red with a touch of white to give it body and a touch of yellow. Got a nice good solid red there. And looking at the palette again, I'm now going to make it a shade darker by adding a touch of black. Now what is that going to do? It's obviously going to make it darker, but what else is it going to do? It's going to make it duller. It's going to make it grayer. So I add red to that. You don't want to lose your intensity of your original color. You want to retain the red, uh, the original color that you started with. The previous layer is still wet and I'm coming with my darker shade of red below and I'm going to blend the two together. And this is a very good exercise in brush control. What do I mean by that? To blend colors in this way you need to be mindful of four things. Firstly the steadiness of your hand, the way you are holding your brush, the amount of pressure you are applying as you apply the paint and how much paint is on your paintbrush. Unless you're covering a huge area with a large brush, it's best not to have too much paint on your brush, especially when doing finer work like this. It just makes the blending and control so much easier. 
and what's nice you can go back and get some lighter shades of red and take your time blending it in nicely. Acrylic does dry quickly but not that quickly. Uh, you do have a couple of minutes. Um, and lastly if you do have too much paint on your brush rub it off on a dry cloth. Uh, I do that all the time. Lastly adding a dark dark shade of red. It hardly, it hardly looks like there's any red in it at all. Here's a touch though. And just makes it really dramatic and stand out. Just a reminder this whole time I've been spraying my palette with water keeping my paints wet. And now for a fun exercise. Uh, I've sprayed this section of canvas with water, evening it out the water with my brush. And I'm using a thinned acrylic. In other words, it's basically a watercolor. It's a watercolor. I'm starting at the top with a yellow, moving down to an orangey red, and then blue at the bottom. Now, if I say watercolor, that means it's a thinned acrylic with no white added. It's got no body. It's not a solid color. It's totally transparent. You can see the texture of the canvas coming through. I'm just going to have a bit of fun with this and uh, see where it goes. It's going to be a very dramatic, you could say, sunset over water. I'm going to start firstly with the watercolor effect and then come over it once it's dry with a second coat of thick acrylic paint. And this is an excellent exercise to try at home or in your studio. Um, Try it on a small canvas. It's just so much easier when you're starting out, especially for the beginners out there, on a small canvas. You can have more fun. You can relax more. Um, find out how much red you need to add to blue to create purple. Get to know your primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. There they are on my palette, the red, yellow, and blue. Lastly, I've mixed a dark purple. Going to suggest a horizon, a suggestion of a landscape, and uh, have fun with it. Another tool one must never forget, apart from the brush in your hand, is your finger. I use my fingers all the time. Uh, they're wonderful just for smoothing off edges, uh, giving nice soft effects, and it's great. You've got lovely control at your fingertips, so use your fingers. Get dirty. So this has been fun, and I think it's looking pretty cool. Now on to mixing the solid colors. Once again, red, yellow, and blue, this time adding the white keeping the color intensity good, keeping it strong, and uh, having fun with it. Now with the second layer on top of the watercolor that's already dried. As with the watercolor stage just now, I'm starting with yellow again. I enjoy working from light to dark. In other words, starting with yellow, moving on to red, and then on to blue in this case. I uh, put my yellow in, now I'm going to mix the red that I want. Uh, red and yellow have something in common. They're both warm colors. But it also makes the transition, uh, the mixture from yellow to red a whole lot easier. Um, to get the red that I want, I'm going to have to add a touch of yellow anyway. There's already yellow on my brush. So this makes the mixing process a whole lot easier and I get the color that I want. So once the paint is roughly applied, I start the blending with very little paint on my brush. Uh, the paint's already on the canvas, so I don't need additional paint. I just need to smooth things over, the transition between the red and the yellow, with a touch of a finger here and there. At this stage, I rinse out the brush before mixing the blue.
now onto the blue, mixing a nice solid color. Now that all the paint is in position, I'm going to rinse off my brush, get all the excess water off, and start with the blending. Uh, now the blue obviously into the orange, into the yellow, into the red, and get a nice soft effect. This exercise is very good practice for brush control, in terms of how you hold the brush, uh, the way one turns the brush, how much pressure you apply in mixing and blending the colors. What's important to note at this stage is that the amount of pressure I'm applying as I mix the paint is very light. It's a very delicate technique as I blend the colors. Do not over blend your colors. Don't push too hard. Don't apply too much pressure. Um, the paints are still wet. They're going to mix together. One knows. I'm sure you all know you mix your primary colors, red, yellow, and blue mix them all together you'll get a muddy grey or a brown and that's what you'll end up with if you over blend or over mix your colors so it's a delicate process but it's very good practice especially for this kind of style um, some artists have a far more aggressive vigorous style that's great uh, but for this demonstration uh, of how to blend colors blending soft acrylics um, it, it's a very very good way to practice Now it's time to mix my purple and do finishing. Uh, I'm going to use the purple obviously at the water's edge, the water line, uh, and uh, finish the effect of the vegetation and the trees at the water's edge. And uh, this also adds the, the contrast that I need. Contrasts are so important in any painting, especially in the finishing stages. Make the dark areas darker and the light areas lighter. It, it just gives life to the painting. Speaking of darks and contrasts, I can just mention that acrylics do become a shade darker as they dry. So I encourage the beginners out there again, get busy painting, have fun, get dirty, use your fingers, use your paints. Uh, get to know your primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Have fun with the demonstration like this. Uh, it's a brilliant exercise. It's fun to do, uh, and you can learn a lot. So go for it. Enjoy it. Now moving on, we're going to continue with a look at mixing military colors. Now for a question I'm often asked, what colors comprise my palette? Well, I use the three primary colors, a black, a white, and an orange. On occasion, I'll use a green or a purple, but for the most part, I like to keep it simple. And for the beginners out there, I suggest you do the same. Too many colors is just simply too confusing, and having less colors on your palette forces you to mix, and that's a very important thing. One has to be able to learn how to mix colors. And it all starts with not having too many paints on your palette. I'm going to paint six well-known military colors often used on World War II aircraft, starting with olive drab. Gray is a foundational color in most military colors. So that's exactly what I did. I started by mixing the gray first, roughly four parts white to one part black, and then added yellow. The minute you add yellow to either black or grey, it gives you this deep olive green colour. It's an unusual trick the way it works, uh, but it, that yellow added with the grey or added with the black gives you a lovely green. Now I'm going to proceed to mix dark green. 
dark green is usually just a touch lighter than olive drab so I've added a touch of white a bit of yellow to keep that intensity of the green color and then a touch of blue because dark green is also slightly brighter than olive drab Next up is Dark Earth. Well, this is simple. It's white, black, and a touch of orange. Once again, a ratio of roughly four parts white to one part black. Um, I probably touched a bit too much black there. It looks a bit too dark, but I'll lighten it up. And once I've got the right gray that I want, I add my orange. And that gives me a very accurate Dark Earth. Now onto a lighter color, that being RAF Sky. It's called Sky, but it's basically a light greeny gray. A lovely color actually. Sky was a color used underneath aircraft, underneath the hurricane or Spitfire, especially during the time of the Battle of Britain, but other aircraft too, right through the war. It's a light color. Here I'm using a bit of the green that I mixed earlier, together with white, and a bit of yellow as well. Now the next color is an interesting color, and that is ocean gray. It's not simply made by mixing black and white, it's slightly more complicated. A black and white would probably give you something similar to a sea gray, however ocean gray has a slight greenish hue which you achieve by adding a touch of yellow. So I mix my basic gray first, I mustn't overdo it, but just a touch of yellow. That gives me an accurate ocean gray. Now the last color I'm going to mix is medium sea gray. Now this is the color that was applied to the underside of aircraft later on in the war, RAF aircraft, and it's essentially a lighter gray. It's white and black, roughly a ratio of 10 parts white to one part black, but it's also a warm gray, so you need to add a touch of orange. Not too much, and not red either, that's going to make it too pink, but just a touch of orange will give you the correct color. Now that's a touch too warm, it's a touch too orange. Uh, so I'm going to add a tiny bit of blue to that. That's going to break the strength of that orange and bring it to the grey that I want. Now why blue and not black? Why did I use blue? Because blue is the opposite side of the colour spectrum. Blue is opposite to orange. Yellow is opposite to purple. Red is opposite to green. So if you've mixed a colour that's too red, you add green, that breaks the intensity of the red. Most of us learnt about using colours at school, but it's good to be reminded again. There are the six colours, olive drab, dark green, dark earth, sky, ocean grey and medium sea grey. I noticed the sky is a bit dark and a bit bright, but it will pass for now. I've now sprayed the colours that I've mixed. They're all still wet and ready to use. I'm now going to paint a basic cylinder. It's a good simple way to demonstrate using these colors um, in a 3D shape. Starting off with the dark green with a basic camouflage pattern. Doesn't look like much at the moment, but there comes the dark earth. Um, and then I'm going to add the layers of texture of light and shade and create a basic 3D effect. A fault on my part was to start the demonstration in the bottom right hand corner. It's a bit out of the picture. Anyway, you can see what's going on. I've just mixed a darker shade of dark earth by adding a touch of black and a tiny bit of orange to retain that intensity of the colour as described earlier. And now I'm going to come in with a second layer of dark green. And then on to the finishing, adding the highlights, the reflected light at the top of the cylinder, 
the darker shadows at the bottom to bring up those contrasts and the last few details. Just the last few thoughts regarding using acrylics. I've heard it said that acrylics can fade. If you use top quality materials, you are guaranteed of a lasting product. I've seen original artworks hanging in people's homes that are exposed to direct sunlight at certain times of the day, which is disastrous. I mean, that is fatal for the painting. It's going to damage the artwork, it's going to damage the quality of the paint after long time exposure. So these are things to keep in mind. Even with your tubes of paint on the table, don't let them stand in the sun. And keep your palette covered while you're not busy. Keep your paints wet, keep them out of direct sunlight, and you won't have any problems. After I'd finished this demonstration of the cylinder, I did a last demonstration of the nose of a Spitfire using a similar technique, slightly rougher here and there, which I also recorded. However, the video recording was a complete disaster, so I couldn't incorporate it in the video. The last section of this video involving painting the cylinder and the military colours I've done on paper. A high quality drawing paper, which is fine for the purposes of this demonstration. However, I thought I must mention those of you who are starting out. Generally speaking, acrylics and paper are not well suited. Paper is highly absorbent, which makes the quick drying time of the acrylic even quicker. Ideally, Acrylics is well suited to canvas. You're going to get the best results. Your drying time is slower on canvas and you've got a much easier flow of the paint. Using a thinned acrylic technique or a watercolor technique on watercolor paper, well then you can get fantastic results. But there is a big difference between sketching or drawing paper and watercolor paper. So these are things to keep in mind, especially for the beginners out there. This demonstration involving the cylinder is rather rough I've done it fairly quickly but it's been fun and hopefully uh, the tips and techniques I've highlighted in this video can maybe be of use to others and have helped to others especially the beginners out there and in closing I think that pretty much wraps it up uh, thanks very much for watching I uh, hope you enjoyed what I shared and uh, please like and subscribe until next time thank you very much